Greetings, everyone. I'm Paul Pepys, director of the Oregon Humanities Center at the University of Oregon. Welcome to this, our first work in progress talk of the academic year. Work in progress talks are presentations given by faculty and graduate students who are current research fellows at the Oregon Humanities Center about their research project. If you have questions at the end of the talk, please use the chat feature of Zoom. I'll moderate and ask the questions. We've also enabled the closed captioning function of Zoom. You can ac activate captions using the live transcript option. It's my pleasure now to introduce our speaker for today, Kristen Bell, an assistant professor at the University of Oregon School of Law and an affiliated faculty member in philosophy. Professor Bell is a graduate of Stanford University, Stanford Law School, and has a PhD in philosophy at, from UNC Chapel Hill. She clerked for the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court and was a senior Lyman Fellow and lecturer at Yale Law School. Bell was selected as a Soros Justice Fellow in 2013, and in that capacity, she did research in prison education and litigation toward improving parole hearings in California for people serving life sentences for juvenile convictions. Her first article on that work, A Stone of Hope, Legal and Empirical Analysis of Juvenile Lifer Parole Decisions, was published in the Harvard Civil Rights Civil Liberties Law Review in 2019. As a 2021-2022 Oregon Humanities Center Faculty Research Fellow, Professor Bell is developing a book about the philosophy of punishment. Her work in progress talk today is titled Reevaluating Justice Behind Bars. Kristen, it's great to have you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. And uh, I am just trying to enter my screen share view here. Does that work? Can folks see it? We're seeing presenter view. We're not seeing the one slide. Ah, okay. Did that help? That's perfect. Okay, great. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, so thank you uh, for the opportunity to present this work and to the Oregon Humanities Center for providing me with the fellowship to do this work. Um, today I'm going to be talking about my project, Reconsidering Justice Behind Bars uh, with Emerging Technology. That's the added bit uh, here today. And um, this is very much a work in progress, and it's built on collaborative work that I do with uh, some computer scientists at Stanford University, Jenny Hong, Kathleen Boss, and Nick McEwen. I've listed them here because this would be impossible without them. Um, and so the, the project that I'm engaging in is um, ultimately going to be a book. I am at the, um, the part of writing the book proposal. So this is a work in progress for the book proposal, which I guess is a work in progress for the book. So it's a double work in progress. Um, so I have, uh, I wanna start out with just an overview of the project as a whole. Um, my presentation will go through these five different steps. So I'll give you the initial idea of um, what I mean by the reconsideration approach. Uh, and it's uh, gonna be illustrated in the context of the California parole system. So I'll, I'll start by having to give some background about what that system looks like. Um, then I will talk through some very strong objections to doing the work in this, in this way. Um, and then I will uh, move on to some responses to those objections, ways that we've changed the approach, um, and then how we can implement it. And then I'll end close with a, a sort of larger reflection on, on themes of justice and mercy. My work in philosophy was on mercy, and we'll see at the end how that comes in. Um, so start at the beginning here with some background about the California parole process. So 50% of California's uh, population of people in prison um, are gonna face the parole board within their sentence period of time. There's about 55,000 people who will eventually be eligible for parole. It's the biggest parole system in the country uh, for um, people serving long sentences. And uh, this data that's on the um, graph here is from 2019. So in that year, there are about 6,000 hearings that were scheduled. Um, the hearing happens with 
uh, two people really, just the commissioner who's a member of the parole board and a deputy commissioner um, who's um, an administrative appointment. And then there's the parole candidate, the person who is incarcerated and is looking to be released on parole. That person gets an attorney in California. Generally, that's an attorney that's appointed by the board of parole hearings, but you can get a private attorney if you have the money to afford that. Um, the DA often comes um, from the county where the crime occurred. And if the victim or the victim's next of kin would like to attend, they can attend as well. And so most people are denied at their parole hearing. You can see here in 2019, 4,880 were denied or, or stipulated or otherwise did not get released. And if you're granted, um, the governor then reviews the cases. The governor reviews all of the, the people who were granted and has the, over, the authority to overturn the decision if it was a murder case. Um, so the governor has gone through different periods. You can see here that only 96, only quote unquote, 96 people were overturned in 2019. Um, uh, in prior years, especially in the early, in the mid 2000s, 99% of people were overturned by the governor. So that number massively shifts. Um, and if a person is denied, they may see the parole board anywhere from one the next year to 15 years later, the parole board gets to decide. So in prior work, I had studied how this process works by reading these parole hearing transcripts. Every hearing produces a transcript that looks a lot like this. Um, and it is about 200 pages long of dialogue between all the parties at the hearing. And my initial low tech approach, which was the, the paper that was described in the introduction, um, I read these uh, about four with uh, two RAs. I read 400 transcripts and we recorded a lot of information that was contained in the transcript, like whether the DA actually came and opposed or whether the person had a job offer. One was the year of their last, uh, 115 means um, in California, um, a write-up for misconduct in prison, whether they did alcoholics and omnis, a lot of different features. Um, and then I created a regression model to kind of figure out what was going on. Um, and the other thing that, the, that came out of that work um, was a better understanding of how the parole system works. I was able to look at how changing different factors could change a person's predicted likelihood of being granted parole using the model that I was able to make um, based on those 400 hearings. So I'm just gonna give you a really um, quick snapshot of some of that. You can see this picture here um, has a number of the different, not all of the features, but a, a short sort of set of the features that I considered, like how many years the person had served, what their score was on a psychological risk assessment that was done before the hearing, their education, um, how many years it had been since their last write-up, and so on. So you can see this is a, this was based on an actual case, um, and this person was denied. Um, and then you can see what happens. For example, if um, you change the if the um, person had been a non-black individual. Um, and they had had a retained attorney. You can see the difference here in the first picture there. Um, this used to be automated, so I could show you and how it moved back and forth, but I couldn't get that to work today. So um, see if the person is, uh, the only things that change here are whether, or their attorney type, whether they were had an assigned attorney by the parole board or one that was privately retained. And the other difference is the race. So whether they were black or non-black. And you can see there's a drastic change to the likelihood of being granted parole. Um, and then I wanna show one other thing that I think is really important is it's not as though um, race and the attorney type were the only things that were influencing this hearing. So in this example, again, this is based on an actual case where the individual was in fact, um, uh, a black parole candidate. Um, he got a private attorney. Um, he got uh, some college classes. He appealed his parole, or sorry, his psychological risk assessment. So that dropped from moderate to low. Now he's got a 98% chance of being granted parole and he was in fact granted. 
And uh, to bring this to an individual level, this is him, Larry Rosser. Um, he was actually uh, my client. Um, and so um, he uh, was incarcerated when he was 16. There's a picture of him. And um, he texted me this picture a couple of weeks ago with his son, Freedom, um, who is doing very well. So I went through, I give this as background of this, this experience that I went through with my, my research because I had this one level where I was trying to describe the whole process. And that was really interesting and sort of important as um, a descriptive matter. But um, representing Larry was a far more meaningful aspect of all of the, the work that I've done on parole. Um, and he taught me probably more than any of the numbers did. So that'll be important when I get to this next phase. So the next phase of my research um, was starting to collaborate with these computer scientists. And they said, gosh, you looked at 400 transcripts. Wouldn't it be amazing if you could look at all of the transcripts? And it turns out there are about 35,000 parole hearing transcripts since the time they started um, electronically recording them in, in about 2007. And their goal, as they said, was to sort of put my brain into uh, the computer so that the computer, so that I wouldn't have to read all these transcripts and my research assistants wouldn't have to read all these transcripts, but the um, uh, natural language uh, processing program could extract the same kind of data that I was pulling. Um, and so this has been three years in the making and um, we've brought together a lot of data um, 35,000 transcripts, we had to sue the state to get the race data. Um, and the important thing here at the end of the slide, you can see um, um, I worked with RAs to manually do a sample of the transcripts, 688 we got through. And then they used that work to train the natural language processing program to do the rest. Um, and there are a number of factors where we, we couldn't get enough accuracy, that technology just wasn't, wasn't there to be able to pull that data. Um, but for 18 of the factors that we were looking at, we were able to get adequate um, data with, with the computer doing the extraction. So it's a lot of data. Um, and so one thing we, we started thinking about was, you know, wouldn't it be neat effectively, that wasn't necessarily the word we used, but um, if, if we could use all of the data and somehow identify outliers or anomalous cases and flag those for reconsideration. So we thought we would be able to kind of go to the parole board and say, gosh, look, 90% uh, of the people who had served 30 years and haven't been written up in 10 years and have done 30 programs were granted. So why don't you take a look at these 10% that had those same important features and weren't granted? And the pro board, um, somewhat needless to say, was not excited about this proposal. Um, and so we thought, okay, they're not interested, but maybe we could work with appellate attorneys who could bring appeals um, for the individuals we flagged, and or we could talk to the governor who also has the authority to change um, the outcome in these decisions. And our, our thinking was also that if insofar as um, a decision was reversed, we could sort of loop it back into our model and further hone the model to identify cases that are actually successful in getting the decision reversed. So we, we're aiming to sort of improve our hit rate on getting people released from prison by um, help, using the technology to help us find the cases that are sort of most promising to um, either get reversed on appeal or to get their outcome otherwise changed. Um, so that was um, our kind of initial first pass. And then um, in thinking about it, um, we there's a lot of objections to doing that sort of thing. Um, and I'm gonna just talk about two of them. One of which is a sort of um, classic problem with using um, any uh, with using algorithmic risk assessment in criminal law, which is the problem that um, the data that's coming in is kind of has bias baked in, and accordingly, it's going to have bias coming out. So, as um, a good example of this, uh, if 
if um, we use the model that I was talking about earlier in the presentation, right, where um, being a black person and having a, um, a board appointed attorney really reduced your likelihood of being granted parole. And a, a quote unquote statistical anomaly in the data might be someone, right, who had those features and was granted. So, so if, um, if being black reduces your chances of getting granted parole, and then you're trying to find cases that were kind of um, anomalous, the fact that a person was black and denied would be fairly normal in the data. Um, and so if you're only flagging the kind of cases that were abnormal, the black person that got granted, you're reinforcing the, um, the pattern of injustice that's in those initial decisions. There's lots of different ways to explain that, but I, I hope that that gets across the main point. And the problem can, is, is deeper than that um, because I'm just gonna leave it there. We can do more in questions. Um, the, the second problem, and I thank Michelle McKinley for putting it this way in um, an initial talk I gave on this was um, the problem of arranging deck chairs on the Titanic which is to say that um, it may be the case that this whole system of making parole systems, or sorry, parole decisions is, is incredibly unjust. They're, the way that we, we do it, the, the structural design of that system may be horrifically bad. Um, and if that's the case, the resources that we need to be spending on it are, um, should be devoted to changing the systemic problems, changing the rules, um, rather than sort of finding individuals that we might be able to save and giving them a life jacket. I'm, I'm butchering the way Michelle put this and I, I apologize for that, but um, the, that sort of idea that it, it can ignore the work that needs to be done at the systemic level by so focusing on the individuals. So, in response to those objections, um, our, our response thus far um, has been to extend what we, we initially thought of as a reconsideration project to what we call a recon approach, which is both reconnaissance and reconsideration, where the idea of reconnaissance is to describe what patterns there are in the existing system to bring them to light so that um, stakeholders can seek system-wide change. So for example, um, a new law governing parole. Um, the second piece, reconsideration, is not is a process for identifying cases for a second look, but we think it's really important that it be um, guided by articulating what the normative goals are and applying them in light of the reconnaissance findings. So we really are uh, do not want to effectively build um, uh, something that can just tell us what the statistical outliers are for decisions and flag those. We want to say, here's, here's the patterns that are driving this system. Maybe those patterns need change. Um, also, the people that got the short end of the stick because of those patterns need to get a second look. Um, and so here's an example of what we would what I what I would call a reconnaissance finding, something um, that's about the general system as a whole. And here, here's one, we have a, a paper coming out on this that's a lot more in depth, but I like this slide because it's simple. Um, uh, each of these bars represents a different commissioner who's been a member of the parole board. Um, and the, um, the vertical axis is their grant rate. So you can see they're ranging anywhere from well under 10% to almost 50%. And so regardless of kind of what you think about parole, it, it seems deeply problematic um, that that would be the case. And we found even when you hold constant other factors um, like 50 other factors, there's still massive variability um, in the commissioner grant rates. So that's something that's only possible really with a massive number of hearings. Um, and then to turn to the reconsideration piece, which is my focus um, for most of the what this book is going to be, is to think about how do we do the reconsideration piece with um, guidance from that um, Recon those reconnaissance findings. 
Um, so the way that I'm thinking about this now is essentially asking kind of two big questions. The first question is what correlates with decreased chances of being granted parole in practice? What's actually reducing a person's chance of being granted parole? Um, and on the other hand, it should definitely not be a reason to grant or deny parole. And on, on this question, you often get agreement on at least some things, including, for example, being a black person, having an appointed attorney rather than a private attorney, and having a particularly punitive parole commissioner. No one thinks that these things really should be making a difference in whether you are granted parole or not, but they all do actually have make a difference. And so one way to think about reconsideration is, hey, let's look at all of the cases that had one, two, or three of these characteristics and were denied, um, with the thinking being that, hey, they should, they, they, we sort of have a standing reason to believe that something might have mattered here. We can't so show causation with any of this, but something might have mattered that shouldn't have. So let's take another look. Um, part of the problem with just this first approach is that it doesn't really limit the numbers a lot. Um, and so, because my goal is to try to get um, a fairly manageable number of cases, um, and this would result in like half the sample. <laughs> um, I should also say that when I included um, these three criteria, we haven't finished our full um, reconnaissance findings for, for that paper. So I use these examples as, of things that were true from the youth offender study. And it looks, um, there's, uh, these are just provisional examples, not actual findings yet. Um, so the, the second thing, or the second big question I'm thinking to sort of maybe limit the numbers um, is what, what should count as a reason to grant parole? Um, and the reason I wanna ask this, this question is um, because among, among the characteristics that we can all agree shouldn't make a difference, there are, um, I think it's important to get some agreement on what really should count as a reason to grant parole. And it's hard to get a lot of agreement here unless you have a shared underlying normative theory of parole. Um, I've developed my own theory and other work, which I'm happy to talk about, but I recognize that we are living in a society with a lot of reasonable disagreement about it. And so what I'm planning to do here is, is aim to kind of democratize or pluralize this process by, um, by bringing together groups of very different stakeholders in the processes and, and asking them, hey, what is it that you think really should be making a difference in this process? So that would include people like the parole board, incarcerated people, victims, legislators, um, maybe attorneys, maybe social workers, um, haven't finalized what that list looks like. But what's important to me here is that um, I'm not asserting exclusively my own view about what should matter. For what it's worth, I think that what a person does in prison should be the primary driver, whether they um, uh, do engage in rehabilitation and they are not recently written up for misconduct, but other people think, for example, it should be about just predicting future violence um, and that that's a matter for a psychologist to try to tell. And so, so, it's, so their thing might be what, um, what should matter is the psychological, sorry, the psychologist's assessment of whether the person poses a low risk, a moderate risk or a high risk. Um, but my, my idea in bringing this together is eventually to um, create a list of criteria um, that can sort down the number, the massive, massive number of cases. So to just give you a really easy, a, a sort of simplified example, um, I might take the whole set of people who have been denied in the last five years and are still in prison and ask, okay, of those people, 
um, something that I might be interested would be of those who haven't been written up for misconduct in the last three years and have done 10 programs um, and were denied. Uh, let's look at all those number of people. Um, and then you might think about, okay, within that, um, let's look at the people who had an appointed attorney rather than a retained attorney and or the people who had a, a more punitive parole commissioner or not, um, or, or um, doing different racial groups separately. There are four big racial or ethnic groups that are designated by California prisons, um, Black, Latinx, um, white, and the prisons um, group of other. So you could imagine within each racial group thinking through um, how to think about these various criteria. So I'm not being super specific here because this is the, the part that I'm still working through exactly how to be fair about formulating how to focus the reconsideration resources. Um, and my goal, um, I included this picture of uh, one of my favorite books, Just Mercy, is to write a book that describes um, how we can use tech in this way. That's a way that, that is different from how tech's otherwise being used in law, um, it's particularly criminal law. And then to take a look at uh, 10 or 20 of the cases that we do find through the um, process of reconsideration and tell their stories on an individual level with a hope of getting um, those individuals legal representation and bringing greater attention to the fact that we need to look more carefully at the people who are left behind um, in this system. So I'll just close by returning to this idea of mercy. Um, uh, in, in other work, I've defended this idea of mercy as critical mercy rather than uh, what you might think of as benevolent mercy, um, uh, a kind of idea of benevolent mercy that is, I think, commonly accepted. This is sort of giving someone less than what they might deserve or less than what would be just. Um, and I try to contrast that with an idea of critical mercy, which is organized not around what a person does or doesn't deserve. It's sort of focused around the fact that the, the legal system is itself deeply imperfect. Um, and because it's imperfect and it's always going to be imperfect, um, we recognize there's a need to include mechanisms for change at the level of rulemaking. Right, we have legislatures that can change laws and that sort of thing. I think it's equally important that this is the part of the work of mercy is that there's also um, an openness to change at the level of alleviating suffering in individual cases. Um, the people who get left behind because the rule hasn't changed yet. And um, you can see examples of this in uh, some politicians approach to clemency, for example, um, Obama, um, was uh, uh, took the authority to grant clemency to a lot of people who had been given um, disproportionately long sentences for drug offenses, particularly um, for crack cocaine and the disparity that that caused in sentencing, giving um, predominantly uh, black prisoners longer terms. Um, and Kate Brown is actually granted sort of systematic clemency to a set of juvenile uh, people who came into prison as juveniles here in Oregon. So you can see these sort of efforts at trying to um, uh, address change on the individual level of cases. And I think th that's what uh, sort of this idea of critical mercy is about or could be about. Um, and the, the part of the problem with critical mercy um, is how to do it, quote unquote, fairly. Um, it is by definition sort of outside of law. Um, uh, there's no legal right to get the kind of reconsideration that I'm talking about or to get the kind of clemency um, that Obama granted. Um, and when, when there's no legal right, there's, a, there's big concerns that 
it can be exercised in a really unfair way that some people will have more access to clemency because they're better at lobbying with the governor or they're friends with the president or something like that, right? We, we see that. Um, and so one thing that I, I'm thinking about um, in terms of tech that, that this kind of technology can help us do is more easily see on a grand scale who is getting reconsideration and why and who's being left out of it. Um, to add more transparency to this, this kind of a process. Um, so it's, it's an idea of trying to make um, the granting of mercy, where mercy is understood as, as that sort of um, level of reconsideration that's outside of law, um, how to make it more fair across the whole system. So that's, that's the, the basic idea, and I apologize, it's not fully articulate. Again, work in progress on a work in progress. I don't even have a working title. I have two ideas, um, none of which is as cool as just mercy, I will say. Um, but just reconsideration, 10 stories calling for a need to change, um, or can tech help us make mercy more just? So I'll end there, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thanks so much, Kristen, for that very interesting work in progress talk. And um, please, everyone, uh, take up Kristen's uh, invitation to ask her questions, make suggestions. Um, please use the chat function of Zoom to do this, and I'll moderate the questions and ask them. OK, we've already got one from Shaul Cohen. Uh, thanks, Kristen, for an interesting talk and your important work. At the beginning, you mentioned a dramatic shift in the rate of acceptance rejection from the governor's office and Kate Brown's recent role in relation to SB 1008 and incarceration of those who committed a crime in their youth. Will you be dealing with the governor's side dimensions in your work? Will you offer policy prescriptions that we can uh, use up here? Can, should mercy circumvent part of the mechanism, the process? So that's lots of questions. Um, one is policy recommendations for up here. I'm not at that stage. Um, I would like to be. I think of that as um, work to be done after. I still don't know um, the extent to which this kind of technology or process can actually be helpful or work. To be, to, it's an, it's frankly an experiment um, in that you know I could go through a process of identifying criteria for reconsideration and then read all of the cases and, um, and tell their stories and find that people are not moved, that, that they think that the decision to keep them in prison was right and fine and correct. Um, I think it's, it's also important to sort of, or they may, it may be that all of the cases that are uncovered are deeply compelling. Um, in which case, I think it's also important to compare it to um, a random sampling of cases to sort of see, is it, are these really compelling because the process of kind of calling them down to a few based on some important characteristics is, is guiding and important? Or is it just that there's so many cases of people that should have been granted and were denied, uh, essentially, um, getting more traction on whether that guiding role that the tech is playing is really helping. Like maybe it's just everyone needs reconsideration. Um, so given that I don't know the answers to those questions, I don't know if um, the, the guiding of the tech toward this reconsideration um, can be helpful in a way that's going to change, change people's hearts and minds about this way this process works. I don't know um, that I can say that I have policy prescriptions as of yet. Um, with respect to uh, the other question about clemency in particular, I think what's really difficult is I haven't said anything about who would be doing this quote unquote reconsideration. As I mentioned, the, the parole board in California was not interested in doing it. I don't think the governor in California is going to be interested in doing it. Um, I'm not sure if that would be different in Oregon, perhaps, um, but I, it's not clear to me who the appropriate party is. At one level, I feel uncomfortable ab about it being state controlled. Um, 
and at another level, I think it's important that um, it be have some sort of state oversight to in, to ensure that it's not um, cherry picking favored cases based on um, idiosyncratic views. So um, that doesn't answer any of your question, but um, I think I think we don't have to answer the question of who ought to be stepping in to do the role of reconsideration. The governor, the parole board, um, maybe the legislature could do it, maybe a judge could do it, maybe a jury could do it. There's lots of different axes at which the reconsideration could occur. What I'm trying to do here is make a case that it's simply important that somebody be doing it. Because if we let the system just run as it is, too many people are getting stuck. And I, I want in telling the stories of those folks who are getting stuck, what the human cost of that is. Uh, so uh, the next question is, is there a connection between your ideal of critical mercy and the project of democratizing the criteria of what should or should not count as a good reason for granting parole? Do you think that all stakeholders whom you are, uh, whom you consider are committed to something like critical mercy? I don't think all the stakeholders are committed to it. Um, the, the rest of the question was much harder. Um, <laughs> um, well, I, I just think a second. Um, so, so the the sort of big picture worry with critical mercy is what you're inviting. And in, in when I've thought about it, I've actually thought of judges taking the role of doing that. I'm not sort of fixated on that, but um, let's imagine it were judges doing it. Um, the worry is that if you tell judges, okay, uh, this person is been incarcerated under law for this many years for this crime and there's no legal entitlement to release there's no legal claim there's no um there's no legal right to release nevertheless you have the authority to grant release if you determine that the amount of time is now simply too much um if you were to give judges that authority the a massive concern would be that some judges are going to exercise it uh, a great deal and perhaps for a preferred population and others won't. And um, there's this massive concern that you're not gonna be treating like cases alike. Um, and that tension, the sort of response to that is, well, yeah, that's why you shouldn't allow this at all. It's kind of you know why we have the law that's designed to structure these things in these ways. Um, and mercy is sort of always um, in this kind of tension. Um, so what I think, what I'm trying to think of tech as helping us do is see if by um, having a view of all the cases laid out, you can, you can monitor the extent to which the reconsideration is equitable across different classes of people. Um, and that can help with this concern that by allowing mercy, you're sort of giving up too much on like cases being treated alike. No, we're not, because we can see the extent to which like cases are in fact being treated alike. Um, that's the kind of idea. Um, the rub is what the heck gets to count as a like case, right? What are the features? And that's where I think that democratization is really important. If it's just my list, um, uh, the if it's the philosopher queen's list, um, that doesn't. It, I mean, it it may have um, some value in being internally consistent. <laughs> I, I would hope, um, but um, it is um, punishment is a democratic exercise. It has to be reflective of the values of the community. Um, and so I think it's important that um, we're looking across 
different sectors of the population to see if we have that. Um, that's as far as I've got so far. So the next uh, questions are from Michelle McKinley and she begins with a comment. Uh, thanks for your talk and uh, Michelle's happy to see the work develop as you think through it. She remains, however, a fervent anti-empiricist, but that's okay. So Michelle wonders though, whether the overrepresentation of people of color in the California prison system would determine some of the numbers you see. Also, could you discuss whether gender enters into the data set? Do you see gender stereotypes working in the Mercy Pearl context as well as racial stereotypes? So, um, what is difficult for me to, to add, I, I um, in thinking through this empirically, there's a difficult problem in that the, the racial and ethnic breakdown of this population, according to the Department of Corrections, which has a lot of um, inaccuracy and issues, um, but it's roughly one third black, one third Latinx, um, one, uh, and then the last third is, um, I'm bl blanking on the numbers, but I think it's about 75% white and 25% other. Um, so what's difficult um, is that, and this is, I think goes to the Titanic point, um, is that those demographics are so wildly disproportionate to the California general population um, that uh, uh, sort of tinkering at the end of the process of who's getting out and who isn't getting out isn't, isn't making a massive difference. Um, that's just, I think, um, I, I guess, I think it's important the the systemic reforms that I'm seeing in California is are really interesting in that um, they are, they've had to reduce their prison population and they have reduced it, um, but all of the reforms that have been passed haven't really touched lifers, this population of people who relies on the parole board to get out. Um, and a question that I'm really interested in, and I don't, I don't have the data to find out, um, is you know the California has chosen not to focus on lifers. There's almost a benign neglect of this part of the prison population, and I wonder if if the lifer population has greater representation by non-white individuals than the rest of the California prison population where there has been a lot of movement in reform. Um, and then I think the, the challenge is, okay, is one reason why there's benign neglect, or I shouldn't even say benign, I don't know why I'm doing it, there's just neglect of the lifer population is, um, that it is predominantly black and Latinx. Um, that I think in and of itself is a problem. Um, and I, so I think in some ways it's really hard to get traction on this population for a number of reasons. I mean, it's, it's hard for legislative reform um, because the gravity of the crimes in this category is really high um, and the fear um, that if someone's released on parole, that they might commit another crime is really high. The numbers of the rate of recidivism among lifers is incredibly, incredibly low. Um, but that fear is there. And so I think I see much of my work as trying to move the hearts and minds of my readers to care about this population. Um, I think, I think unless and until people start caring about this population of people in prison, um, we're gonna continue to see this neglect um, of reform in that area. Um, and as much reform as a, of criminal law you wanna do, if it doesn't touch lifers, at least in California, 
that means it's not touching at about half of that population or a third. I think it's about a third now, I should say. Um, so I, I'm not sure. I'll move on to the gender question there. Um, so there, the, the population is predominantly male in our regression model. We couldn't include gender because there was like less than 5% um, were identified as women. Um, so that is hard as an empirical matter. With respect to, um, uh, there's, a, there's good qualitative work on this though, um, with respect to race, there's, there's folks who've looked at the hearings to see the kind of language um, that's used and the kind of stereotypes that do arise in these hearings. Um, and anecdotally, I've seen a lot of that in reading transcripts with respect to gender as well. There was, there's one that comes to mind where um, an individual who was denied parole had been written up for, I don't know, a visitor, his girlfriend had brought in, I think drugs into the prison and the parole commissioner actually asked him straight out, how could you let your woman do that? Um, you, you need to be the man of that house. And I'm, <laughs> this is not completely unusual to hear that kind of talk in a parole hearing, um, which is, it, I mean, it's really striking and you, you see it with respect to race as well. Um, but be, part of the problem is that parole hearings are so closed off to the public. They occur in California, at least they occur within behind prison walls and no one really reads these transcripts. Um, so again, I think um, the, the qualitative work is incredibly important to do with the transcripts um, and can help shine the light of the, the public eye on, on the problems that are here. I, I think by no means does the empirical work really explain the depth of what's going on here, not even close. Um, so to that, uh, it, for, for anyone wanting to do qualitative work on these parole transcripts, I, I certainly welcome help. I can't do it because I'm not trained to, but <laughs> um, I, I agree with the need that it needs to be done. So in the um, algorithms that you've created or with your, your collaborators, do you consider victim testimony in the predictive parole outcome and or do you believe there is undue consideration placed on victim testimony in sentencing and parole practices. So the first is easy because it's a descriptive question and yes, it's in our model and yes, um, the victim opposing does reduce the likelihood of parole. Um, and um, I don't know the role in sentencing. Um, sentencing is very different than parole. Um, I think in the parole context, um, in my theory of parole, what the victim's position is shouldn't make a difference to the parole outcome. Um, I don't think it's relevant to the question of whether the person um, is ready for release. Um, but I do, I in, in seeing some of these hearings and, and listening to victims, I think it can provide um, and I think it, it, it's important that there's a space for the victim to speak. Um, and, and I don't know if, if it's appropriate for that space to be at the parole hearing, but if that aspect of the parole hearing were to go away, I would hope that there be another forum or so, something um, because it, it is incredibly difficult for victims um, at the parole hearing stage, um, especially if a person repeatedly comes up for parole because then every three years a, a victim's going and, and testifying and everything comes back up. And um, I think there's a lot of work to be done to improve um, what victims have to go through in these hearings. Um, yeah. Uh, next question. Uh, could you tell us more about the lawsuit uh, with the state of California in your effort to get the race and ethnicity data, was that data initially withheld intentionally or just not included in the transcripts? Um, well, it's not included in the transcripts. And so we had to request it. We did a California Public Record Act request and we were denied. Um, it is 
public record. We argued and we retained counsel. Um, the Electronic Frontier Foundation represented us pro bono. We went to Zoom court, we won. The judge was infuriated at the Department of Corrections for withholding this. Um, and what was a learning lesson for us as well was that partway through our negotiations before we had to file the lawsuit, um, we had a lot of discussions to see if we could negotiate. Um, and it, it became clear that part of the problem was that I was on the team and I had written a, a prior article about juvenile hearings where race was found to be significant. Um, and there were, it, it, it was sort of clear that if I were removed, they might have gotten the data. Um, and that was upsetting. Um, so I think one of the lessons, and we we talk about this a lot with any kind of re recon approach, reconnaissance and reconsideration, I think it's really important that the researchers have a degree of independence from the state agency themselves and have access to the underlying data which is always hard to get both of those, the independence um, and the access. So you mentioned earlier um, the problem of uh, bias in and bias out. That is to say that the system is such that the, the people that are incarcerated, their incarceration is tainted by the biases in the system. Uh, and you've talked about ways in which your uh, recon approach is trying to alleviate some of those problems. This question is about um, bias that's baked into algorithms themselves. This is the work that Ruha Benjamin, for example, works on. And I was wondering if you might say something about that particular problem of bias in using machine learning or, or data analysis to, to get at these kind of ethical uh, conundrums. Mm. Um. I, I think what I what I can speak to most clearly is the work that um, we've done in, in in this particular project. Um, and we don't really rely on um, a, a kind of algorithm in the in the sense that the big lift of the tech in this project is the natural language processing that just extracts the information out. Um, cause we, we rejected the idea that we would want them to have, you know, the, the, on the, the, this idea that the, could create an algorithm to sort of see which cases were anomalous or statistical outliers and like that. We didn't want to do that for the reasons that were mentioned there. So the, the way that we're using the tech is really limited to the natural language processing. Um, but, um, it's really important to push on the extent to which that kind of technology has the same problems. So one thing that we haven't looked at and we would like to look at, for example, is whether um, the natural language processing is as accurate at obtaining certain data fields from parole candidates who have English as their first language compared to not English as their first language. Um, or racial differences, or you know, maybe maybe whether you have a private attorney makes it less accurate because maybe the order of the hearing is more confusing to the software. Um, so these are the those are kinds of things that we we haven't done yet, but we we would need to do to be responsive to that really important point. Thanks, Kristen. We've come to the end of our questions. Uh, I've got no more in the chat. So I want to thank you so much for sharing this fascinating uh, work in progress and for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone, for joining us for Kristen Bell's Work in Progress talk. Uh, please join us in two weeks for our next Work in Progress talk, which is being given by Michelle McKinley, who's with us today. For more information about the Oregon Humanities Center, or if you'd like to contribute to supporting our research and public programs, go to ohc.uoregon.edu. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you in two weeks.